Arizona PBS is proud to support Indian Country Today. For six decades, we've provided television programs and now digital content. But we go beyond that, sending outreach teams across Arizona, offering workshops in language and literacy, family engagement and community outreach, and supporting tribal communities with early learning and school readiness resources. Join us at azpbs.org. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. One tribe is buying back an island it lost 160 years ago. The Passamaquoddy tribe is located in Massachusetts. Recently, the tribe purchased Pine Island for $355,000. It's the latest in a series of successful land back campaigns by tribes. The Guardian reports these campaigns followed the loss of 1.5 billion acres since 1776, which resulted in poverty, violence, and cultural apartheid for Native people. The small tribe, which now has 3,700 citizens, lived on the island for at least 10,000 years. In 1794, Pine Island was officially granted to the tribe by Massachusetts for its service during the Revolutionary War. But when Maine became its own state after 1820, colonists changed its title, saying the treaty was voided. In the 1851 census, there were 20 Passamaquoddy living there, but just 10 years later, there were none. In March, with a grant from conservation charities, the tribe raised the money to finally buy back the island. Attorney and Passamaquoddy tribal citizen, Corey Hinton, says he hopes Maine's legislature will make it easier for the tribe to acquire other lands. The effort to get the Mono Lake Paiute tribe federally recognized is coming down to the wire. The tribe in Central California once numbered 4,000 and are now down to 83 people. They have been fighting for federal recognition for 150 years. The LA Times reports the, that U.S. Representative Jay Obernoth introduced a bill in the House asking Congress to grant the tribe federal recognition. More than a dozen federally recognized tribes in the area support the Mono Lake Paiute's efforts to gain federal recognition. Even the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service recognize the tribe's cultural and ties to the land. Charlotte Lang is the tribe's chairwoman. She's been working on recognition for two decades and says the bill is exciting to her. The Mono Lake Paiute are among two dozen unrecognized and landless tribes in California. Obernolten introduced the bill on June 1st, and it still needs to pass both the House and the Senate and requires the president's approval. While the Duke and Duchess of Sussex may be living near the site of an amazing discovery related to California's indigenous history, artifacts and remains believed to be more than 10,000 years old were found near their home in Montecito. The Santa Barbara's sheriff's office told the Daily Mail the remains were unearthed during construction. Early forensic findings suggest the remains could be from the Chumash people who lived in the region. Currently, there are around 5,000 Chumash citizens living there today. Authorities are currently in talks with the local Native American Commission to discuss the process going forward. Canada's Grand Council Treaty 3 is starting Pride Month by announcing a new LGBTQ2S Council for the territory. It's also pledging to include all community members in its governance. Grand Council Treaty 3 is the national government of the Anishinaabe Nation in Treaty 3 territory, which is primarily in northwestern Ontario. The chiefs of this Grand Council passed a resolution last year to include this new council. The council is in addition to Treaty 3's governance model and will exist alongside the elders, youth, women, and men's councils. Wawate Fabister, who is Anishinaabe from Grassy, Nation, Grassy Narrows First Nation and was hired last month as the new council's coordinator. Fabister will help shape the council's vision and mandate as well as lead pride initiatives. While he's working on creating an online presence, a virtual two-spirit powwow for the territory is also being planned for later this month. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. 
it was it sets up a unique government relationship with tribes in Alaska. As the anniversary for this landmark legislation approaches, Indian Country Today is starting a series of reports on ANCSA. The first report in our series will help you understand the various Native organizations and layers of tribal enrollment options within Alaska. And you can read the story on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. Search for the headline, Cheat Sheet, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act 101. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholahungva. June is Gay Pride Month in the United States. Today we'll be speaking with a health professional about what good sex education looks like within the LGBT community. And a new film documents the life of a two-spirit teenager. We'll be right back. Imagine being a Native American LGBTQ youth, sitting in a classroom where teachers and textbooks fail to appropriately address their identity, behavior, and experiences. Nowhere is this absence more clear and potentially more damaging than in sex education. Asia Brown is a sexual health communication specialist for the Washington Youth Sexual Health Project. Brown supports the circulation of youth-friendly and inclusive sexual health content. She's also a team member at We Are Native, an organization striving to promote holistic health and positive growth in local communities and the nation at large. Welcome, uh, Asia. Hi, thank you for having me today. Good morning, everyone, at least from where I'm at. <laughs> so there's this challenge of trying to get basic instruction with health. What, what does the, what's a good sex education program look like? So to me, a good sexual education program looks like a program that is one, inclusive, two, affirming, and three, is relatable. Those, those three components are what really stands out to me because they seem to be lacking in a lot of places. And a lot of that is due to social justice issues pertaining to colonization, heteronormativity, trauma, and a lot of those things we see in public health. And it's because it severs a lot of our relationships to each other our bodies and our community in general. And so I feel like those three main issues really speak to what we need in sexual health education. A affirmation is so important. And you think about um, a young person struggling with even identity issues and thinking I'm the only one and this is new. And to think there's this long history and a large community that kind of changes everything right there, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's part of what makes this work so powerful because what we're celebrating up here in the Pacific Northwest with the WISH project is all the work that's been done before that leads us to this moment right here, while also acknowledging all the work that needs to do. And just like you said, the affirmation piece is really huge and it's really powerful. Um, honestly, when you think about it, just the simple act of using someone's correct pronouns has such a deep and profound impact as reducing depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation, and suicidal behavior in trans youth. So these things are really important and are very deep and profound in our communities and in each other and an individual who really need that affirmation. And again, the sexual health communication aspect of it really speaks to what we need to do to move forward. We live in an area where social media has become so important. How, how does that factor into some of these challenges? Oh, sexual health in general is really challenging sometimes. I think, again, because of the social justice issues of trauma and especially the huge influence of Western religion tying into that with colonization, we have a huge emphasis on shame and discomfort when it comes to talking about sexual health. However, here at the health board, we work with an epidemiology center that really shows us the data and research that backs up what we're doing. And we're also working with an analysis team called MarketCast that shows us what youth want and need when it comes to um, sexual health education. And sometimes when translating that into social media, it can be difficult because we're trying to connect the youth to the caring adults. And again, like I said, with the social justice issues happening, the challenges really come through in those aspects. And so for me, one way to help address that is to be culturally sensitive. You know, sexual health is respectable. It's, you know, a huge part of who we are. 
and there's nothing shameful about it. It's very enduring, just like us. And so all these like humor and sweetness and a lot of those techniques to help make social media, you know, relatable, affirming and fun really helps, I would say offset, I don't want to say offset, but like it will help, you know, soften some of those challenges. You mentioned what youth want. What's the takeaway from that and things that people should know that's really important? So the takeaways I would like folks to know is again, just the inclusivity. Sexual health is more than just about, you know, our sexual, physical um, health. It's really about wellness and our well-being. And you should really approach it with a holistic viewpoint. That's why inclusivity is so important. And that's why this is what youth really need. You know, our sexual health also includes our mental health and learning to take care of ourselves and our bodies in that way you know, is something that's really important. And I think that also translates to why shame is such a huge part of that. Um, one social media post I made that was like really huge was talking about masturbation and masturbation as self-care. And that really spoke to a lot of youth because it talks about mental health and it talks about how we take care of our bodies, but it also shows again, those challenges. And so that's why I think it's important for people to, you know, not only be inclusive in our language and how we approach sexual health, but really to look at it in that holistic way, you know, and to affirm those things that, you know, now it's becoming a hot topic, but it really wasn't, you know, before it was normalized and acceptable. And because of colonization, we're starting to see this being brought to the forefront. So we remember these ways. We only have a few seconds, but uh, how important is culture into this conversation? It's everything, you know, culture, our identity, and, you know, that goes directly to sexual health and our bodies and our identity. And, you know, again, before colonization and all this, these things were normalized. These things were acceptable. And so we need to remember and bring that back again and to, you know, undo some of that trauma and, and start our healing. You know, we've done so much great work and there's still a lot to look forward to. Asia Brown, thank you so much. Thank you. Sharente Harris is a cultural educator, artist, and activist. Harris is subject of a recently released documentary titled Being Thunder. Over the course of several years, the film documents the two-spirit, gender, queer teenager from the Narragansett tribe in Rhode Island, revealing the struggles faced by the determined teen. She is currently attending Brown University. Welcome, Sharente. Asko Ikwa, son. Thank you for having me. Let's start by just uh, telling your story, uh, where we, we start with it. Yeah, so my story begins as a young teenager uh, realizing that I was two-spirit and luckily having a family that loved and supported me and was in touch with our traditional ways. Um, and then that journey was a process of many comings out uh, to my tribal community and the tribal communities around me. And that was all facilitated through dance. And I come from a family of champion powwow dancers. And it, it, I have always been taught that through our dance, uh, we give sacred prayer. And if I was not dancing in a style that spoke to my two-spirit identity, I would be lying to myself and my prayer would be empty. So I began fancy shawl dancing as a two-spirit person, biologically born male, and shook things up in a drastic way within my tribal communities. You mentioned uh, navigating through various coming outs. How, how did that occur? And um, what were kind of the challenges along the way with that? I feel very blessed that my home unit um, has always been right behind me because there's so many other two-spirit people in my tribal community, uh, cousins that uh, at one point, danced at powwows, but today feel uncomfortable uh, and have almost uh, been separated from so much, many of our tribal gatherings um, because of the homophobia and transphobia. Uh, coming out isn't something that I think LGBT people ever just do once. 
every time you meet someone new um, or even when you're revisiting old loved ones, it's a constant journey of uh, making clear who you are. Uh, and that can be difficult when who you are is somewhere in this gray area. Uh, but I've leaned into that and embraced that um, because it is those in-between places that I feel are the most beautiful and are the most representative of our source um, where all things connect, even the most seemingly opposite. One of the reasons why I think uh, Pride Week is so important is it allows stories like yours to be told and for people who are dealing with these issues every day, trying to come to some sort of satisfactory next step. Uh, what advice would you have for young people wrestling with this? There was a point in my journey when I danced um, that was very difficult for me. Um, I was facing so much hatred and vitriol that I felt like it wasn't worth it to continue proudly being myself, that it would just be easier to, to go away. But it was actually the voices of other young people, of people that had stories of loved ones that had passed away before them, that had walked the same path that I did uh, saying that, you know, they only dreamt of being able to do what I was able to do. And young people being so inspired because so often, I think as indigenous people, we go invisible, but then even within our communities, our two-spirit people are invisible on top of that. And uh, simply being seen as such a gift um, so it can be extremely tough. And for some people, they don't have safe places to be able to be themselves. Uh, but I urge them to not give up and to know that things will get better and there will be a place for them and that they are special. Um, and they, they are not a mistake. I think of your story and those who no longer dance. Was dance healing? Absolutely. Um, I am so blessed to have uh, this documentary, Being Thunder, uh, that chronicles this period of my life because without dance, my community and the surrounding communities, the change that's happening across Turtle Island would not be happening. I'm two-spirited and more than just being a member of the LGBT community that's indigenous, I truly identify with both the spirit of a man and a woman. And the most controversial act I have ever committed in my life is being true to myself. Working that path, figuring out who I am and how to find acceptance with myself and within my community has been one of my greatest struggles. Sharente, thank you so much. Katabatesh, thank you. When we come back, a look at the numbers when it comes to the data about the coronavirus pandemic. Will we ever know how many Native people the virus claimed? As Indian country continues to navigate the coronavirus pandemic, one thing is already clear. The exact number of cases may never be known. Data is held by a number of entities from tribal, state, county, and even international medical centers, creating barriers to collecting the information. Indian country today partnered with the Indigenous Investigative Collective to look at this issue. Jordan Bennett-Begay, our managing editor, was part of the team reporting on the challenges. 
She joins us now to explain more about what they found and what they didn't find. Welcome, Jordan. Hi, Mark. Yata. Thanks for having me. So really quickly, what was the summary of the project? Uh, our goal was to find a reliable death count for American Indians and Alaska Natives who died from COVID-19. And there really is no accurate death toll um, from this investigation that we found. What, what were some of the reasons why um, folks weren't able to collect that data? Um, there are a couple, you know, there's several reasons, but the one that we focused on was number one was death certificates. Um, it's really difficult um, for, you know, there's really no, there's standards for filling out death certificates, but who fills those out? Um, you know, it's different among the, you know, all the states. You have the physicians, the coroners, medical direct, uh, medical examiners, and funeral directors, right? Um, I know uh, Abiyo Akohawk, who I spoke with for the story, said some, you know, sometimes, you know, doctors like look at the bodies and have to identify it without a family member. But for a funeral director I talked to, Robert Gill, um, in Minnesota, he said that he does talk to the family, but when he does send that information to the state, he doesn't know what the state does, you know, with that information. Um, and just in the last year or two of this pandemic, I mean, I've talked to multiple F experts saying, you know, asking what was the problem in racial misclassification. Um, and they pointed to the same, you know, the same um, contributing factors. And the other one was, you know, there's really no one system that aggregates all this data, right? You have the, cause the Indian health system is so complicated. You know, it's made up of IHS direct health facilities, tribally run and own operated facilities, private hospitals, private clinics. Um, you know, there's really no way to know um, and where every native person goes, you know, is up to their own situation. Um, but there's really no one place where all this data is collected. The CDC has one number, um, other, you know, third party entities have another number. You know, Indian Country Today, we try to start our own database because IHS wasn't doing it. And IHS doesn't do it because they know that racial misclassification is a huge deal and they're, um, they're not doing it, right? You've worked with other teams on this. Uh, tell us what Christine Trudeau was working on. Yes, uh, so Christine's role was really huge in this investigation. She filed freedom of uh, information requests for death records in four states. My role has been primarily to track and uh, file FOIA requests and also refile requests once we get certain information in. And after we had filed these initial requests with this project back in January, I believe, um, we were trying to get at, you know, why were they taking longer to get back to us? And then why were they being rejected? And my role was in calling those uh, records custodians and asking them for more information on what we can get from the data um, if we couldn't, if certain things were, um, were not able to be released to us. So yeah, back and forth, uh, what I learned over the course of the last six months of this investigation was just um, that the primary reason we were rejected was because uh, they felt that it would be a violation, violation of um, a federal law to release that information and um, so yeah and without that information we can't really get an accurate picture of what what the overall death count is and sunny class trilogy was working on the story what did she rework on uh yes sunny focused on the ground level reporting and she talked with health officials at the utah navajo health system and she told me she found one thing that surprised her uh, from her reporting I think that it it shouldn't have, but it did. Um, and one of the things was it's it's so easy to forget about how behind we still very much are on the Navajo Nation, um, and that could mean in a lot of different things. But in terms of data, it was very hindering for organizations to not just collect data because of the lack of resources, including technology, um, but also just sharing it, communication efforts. Um, you know, I was I was really surprised to have one of the the uh, data technicians there at Utah Navajo tell me that, you know, just communicating with chapters, they often had to do it with, through fax. And if you know the Navajo Nation, and if you know communication on the Navajo Nation, it's not all that great. And to to know that they had to fax the information to chapter houses, and I just I just thought it was a little. A little crazy and you know it's things like that that can really contribute to 
not having these numbers or not being able to share them. And so I think that was, again, it shouldn't have been surprising to me, but it very much was. It was just kind of like a another wake up call, if you will, of the kinds of things that still really hinder um, just people's jobs that are very important. Are there any takeaways from this project, solutions that might work? Oh, solutions, I mean, one, you know, Indian country, all of their health systems, you know, they don't talk to each other was one of the big takeaways um, that I heard from Abigail, right? The CDC receives um, data from states and tribes and Excel spreadsheets, PDFs um, on Navajo, like uh, Sunny just said that their chapter houses have to fax their data back and forth, um, different health, tribal health um, systems. Um, you know, there's no standard for it. They have different um, electronic medical records that make the death, you know, a, you know, an accurate death toll count impossible. Thank you, Jordan bennett -Begay. Thank you, Mark. Once again, you can read the full story on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. The headline is A Broken System, Why the Number of American Indian and Alaska Natives Who Have Died During the Coronavirus Pandemic May Never Be Known. And that's the slice of our indigenous world. Join us again tomorrow and online at IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.